Okay, hello everybody. Uh, now it's uh, our Congress, first Congress of Skiogran Europe starts. I would like to welcome you officially again as uh, participants to our first Congress and thank you very much for, for all for being here. And uh, now we're going to start our uh, new, um, our session with, sorry, but I have also my, the ERT of Duno. <laughs> <laughs> our session, which is about the clinical trials, and uh, our first speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, Andreas Goulas, which is um, Ules, which is assistant professor, Department of Pathophysiology, School of Medicine, National and Cambodian University of Athens, uh, in Greece, in Athens. Uh, so, Professor Goulas, the floor is yours. Can we have the presentation, please, Aris? Good afternoon. Welcome to Athens. Uh, before I start my talk, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the very kind invitation. Uh, Katie and Coralie for being here. All of you, of course. Uh, I would just like to mention that um, it is very honorary for a clinician or a scientist to be invited by the patients he or she serves. I think it's, it's uh, very honorary. And uh, I will move quickly to the talk, you see the topic, um, clinical research, yeah, clinical research in, uh, in Europe, uh, I have no disclosures, the, the current talk has two parts, in the first part we will discuss some clinical projects related to what was presented in, by the essential study group in Euler um, um, 2023, and the second part is actually a review of the clinical trials with some good news. Unfortunately, I cannot include all the clinical information. Uh, this is the poster that was presented by the Essential Study Group in Euler 2023. Not all research groups are represented in this poster, but there is uh, intensive clinical and translational research across Europe by many groups uh, in different countries. UK, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Austria, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Greece. So there is a intensive, as I said, clinical and translational research in the field of Sjogren's disease. And I will try to give you very briefly a flavor of the clinical project. I will start with uh, the necessity project. Uh, Dr. Hadzis later on will speak in more details this is a, an IMI2 European project aiming to develop and introduce new endpoints for clinical trials uh, in Sjogren's disease. And uh, actually, uh, this is the STAR, the STAR index. It's a new tool to assess clinical uh, trials, the efficacy of treatments and drugs. And um, as you may see, STAR consists of five items. Uh, each one representing important clinical aspects of the disease, including disease activity, systemic disease activity, uh, patients reported outcomes, salivary and lacrimal gland function, and biologic parameters. Each item has a specific weight as represented by the point and a very strict definition of the response. And if a patient who receives a treatment, gathers more than five points, is considered a responder. STAR was developed by an expert consensus plus data-driven approaches after analyzing nine randomized clinical trials through a very complex methodology. And as I said, it was recently published and it was externally validated in two additional clinical trials, as you may see in the first trial. It was shown that uh, the combination of rituximab, belimab achieved a higher proportion in star responders in the treatment group compared to placebo. Uh, and in the second study, as you may see, there was no response uh, according to star in the uh, abatacept treatment arm. We have a new tool to assess clinical studies and you will see in the next slides the usefulness of this uh, tool. 
Now, in the context of the necessity, there is an ongoing prospective clinical study to assess the efficacy of combinational treatments, hydroxychloroquine plus leflunomide, hydroxychloroquine plus MMF, two cohorts with low and high disease activity. You're all familiar with these uh, terms. And the, um, the clinical trial is ongoing. And until Monday, 96 patients have been already recruited, participating in the study. We're waiting the results of this study um, with uh, 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 pleasure. And uh, we hope that these results will provide us with a new um, treatment. Now, in the context of the harmonics, recently we have published uh, a series of patients with lymphoma. 76% of them suffer from the histologic type of MALT. MALT lymphomas are mild and indolent. 10% of patients suffer from diffuse large B cell lymphomas, a more aggressive form of lymphoma. This is the clinical picture of patients with MALT lymphoma. We focused on MALT lymphoma patients. And these patients, at the time of Sjogren's diagnosis, they present more frequently with side valley gland enlargement, palpable purpura, high systemic disease activity, high focus score, low C4 complement levels, and uh, cryoglobulinemia, and on the contrary, lower frequency of autoimmune thyroiditis. So this is the clinical picture of patients who will develop mild lymphoma at the time of Sjogren's diagnosis, but it's not worthy that Many of these clinical manifestations are predictors of mild lymphomas, and at the same time, they may represent part of the disease itself, I mean the lymphoma. So when you, you're trying to, to develop reliable predictors for mild, you must avoid the temporal clustering of these two entities. There must be a temporal distance between Sjogren's diagnosis and um, uh, lymphoma diagnosis. Keep this in mind. And these are the uh, survival curves for patients who suffer from mild lymphoma. Although mild lymphomas are considered, as I said, mild and indolent, in the long term, patients have overall survival rates of 80%, and those with diffuse large B cell, the more aggressive form, 40%. This means that although mild lymphomas are indolent, they have an impact on mortality and morbidity of patients. And it is necessary to diagnose these patients and follow, the, follow them up uh, closely. Now, if we diagnose patients soon, is it going to change the, pro the prognosis of these patients? The answer is yes. You can see now two international scoring systems for patients who specifically suffer from mild lymphomas. And their prognosis depends on the stage the disease is diagnosed. This is the uh, Arbor system. So if you have stage four or three, it means that the disease is extended and this affects adversely the prognosis of patients. So we need to diagnose mild lymphoma in Sjogren's as soon as possible, even if we have to do with mild lymphomas. So we need reliable predictors. And in the context of the harmonics, it's one of the last uh, works we have done. We recruited patients from Athens, um, Pisa with Chiara Baldini and Udine, Salvatore uh, De Vita and uh, Luca Quartuccio. We collected 80 patients with mild lymphoma whose diagnosis is at least three years distant from the uh, time of Sjogren's diagnosis. So there is a, a distance between the two diseases and the manifestations cannot be overlapped between the two entities. And we did a data-driven analysis showing that the most distant, temporally distant, independent risk factor for predicting mild lymphomas are rheumatoid factors. And in the other uh, table, you can see the predictors three to four years before the development of lymphoma. Uh, and another independent risk factor has been added, high disease activity. So this is a roadmap how to diagnose patients earlier and how to follow them up towards lymphomogenesis. These are unpublished data, and I'd like to thank at this point Chiara and Luca who participated in this project. Uh, some interesting clinical information from the Big Data Consortium from Manuel Ramos Casals. 
they provide us with um, the risk factors, the predictors of mortality in Sjogren's after analyzing more than 11,000 patients. Uh, so they showed that high disease activity and cryoglobulins are associated with uh, all-cause deaths and Sjogren's related death. And our patients die of hematologic malignancies, pulmonary and lintan involvement, vasculitis, infections, and cardiovascular risk. It's a very interesting clinical information for all of us, and especially for those who treat patients with Sjogren's. And this is the very interesting project proposed by uh, Martin Stratner from Austria. So he, he had the idea, along with uh, DV Cornec, to see how the disease evolves in preclinical stages by studying three distinct populations. The first population has patients with anti rho positive onto antibodies, but without any symptom of systemic autoimmunity. The second population are first degree relatives uh, of patients with uh, Sjogren's who have abnormal immunologic profile. And the third population individuals with at least one feature um, of Sjogren's, but these patients do not fulfill the criteria. All these patients will be followed up. We will collect clinical data, biologic samples to see how the disease evolves. And until June, um, Martin has already recruited 31 individuals of whom 25 had anti antibodies and four developed Sjogren's disease. And there's also a survey for the relatives until June 677 uh, individuals have responded to this um, survey. So this is also an interesting um, project to see how the disease moves from the preclinical stage to the clinical stage. And this is a, another interesting uh, project from Chronicle, Hedrika Butchman and his group and her group. Uh, so they, they studied the lip biopsy in, in a very different way than usual. You all know the focus core. The focus core participates in the diagnosis of, of Sjogren's disease. So they also added some simple uh, and uh, easy uh, histopathologic features, like the presence of lymphohypothelial lesions, the plasma cell shift, and the presence of germinal centers. And they concluded that if you have any two of these four features, you may diagnose lymphoma easily, uh, Sjogren's easily. And this is a, an ultra-guided corneal biopsy strategy proposed by um, Salvatore, Luca, and Alan Zabotti in Italy. They uh, developed a technique to biopsize uh, parotids and submandibular glands uh, and set the diagnosis not only of lymphoma, but also Sjogren's disease. The yields are very good. The technique seems safe. They follow a specific strategy. Uh, there are no permanent uh, complications, only transient and easily to manage. And now we'll move uh, quickly to the second part with the um, clinical trials. You all know and you are familiar with the two indices, ESSDI and ESSPRI. The ESSDI actually is a measure of the overall disease activity, and the ESSPRI represents patients' reported outcomes in terms of pain, fatigue, and dryness. So these two indices have been used for two purposes. First, to recruit patients in clinical trials, and second, to define the primary outcomes of clinical trials in some uh, specific ways, as you may see. So the efficacy of a drug until now has been assessed with these two uh, indices. And this is a, a table summarizing the most important biologic agents that have been used to treat Sjogren's disease, among them rituximab, belimbab, and others. The majority of these clinical trials have been considered as negative because they didn't meet the primary endpoints, uh, which are related mainly to ESSDI and ESSPRI, uh, with some exceptions, of course. But this is the general idea, and the question is why? There are reasons related to the disease itself, and there are reasons beyond the disease. For instance, we all know that Sjogren's disease is a slowly progressive disease. So the, the observation time in clinical trials is short, six to 12 months. So this is a reason 
to have an inefficacy of biologic agents. Uh, there is, as you know, phenotypic diversity in Sjogren's disease, meaning that in this clinical trial, many different patients with many different clinical manifestations have been recruited. And we're not sure that we understand the disease, especially the pathogenesis of the disease. Beyond these reasons, we may don't have the proper tools to capture efficacy of a drug. And for this reason, new uh, tools have been developed, like the CRES and the STAR. And we may have to uh, stratify patients in a different way, meaning that a subgroup may have benefit from some of these treatments. I will give you some examples. These are two uh, clinical trials well known in Sjogren's uh, field, the Joker and the repurpose study. The first is a negative study. Patients received hydroxychloroquine to control their symptoms. And according to the primary endpoints, this was a negative study. The patients didn't benefit from this medication, but we wonder if this is true or not. And the, the REPERP assesses a combination treatment um, with hydroxychloroquine and flunomide a small pilot study with good effects. Let's forget the positive study and go back to Joker study. You have heard that there are patients with high interferon signature and patients with low interferon signature. So if we stratify patients into those with high versus those with low, maybe we could detect a benefit in the Joker study. Actually, this was done. There was no difference. So the, it, there's no difference uh, if you have high or low uh, interferon signature. It is a biomarker in blood. Uh, and Phi, who is not here, uh, had the idea to stratify patients in a different way. Patients reported outcomes, so they used five symptoms. Pain, dryness, fatigue, uh, depression, and anxiety. And they classified patients into four groups. And they reanalyzed the results from, um, from Joker study. And they found out that those who have high symptom burden may benefit from hydroxychloroquine, meaning that if we stratify patients in a different way, we may find subgroups who may benefit, even if the uh, overall treatment effect is negative. It is another way to start thinking how to treat our patients, and we move from um, overall um, treatments to precision medicine treatments. Um, these are the two uh, new tools we have to reassess the efficacy of old and new clinical trials, the CRES and the STAR. These are valuable tools to see the efficacy of new treatments. And some good news uh, in the community, um, we have promising results from uh, three clinical studies. The first is the analoma, the monoclonal antibody. Uh, it was given in three different treatment uh, doses. And the change of ESS dye, we still use the old indices. Um, the change of ESS dye from baseline was significant in the three treatment arms in a dose-dependent manner. Um, and this was, this was also the case for Iskalimab, another monoclonal antibody, but only for patients who received the drug intravenously. So we have two positive uh, clinical trials, promising results. And this is um, another combinational treatment uh, published in 2022. Patients received monotherapy with belimbam, reduximab, or the combination. The very important finding is that there is complete depletion of B cells within the salivary glands. That's very important for our disease. And of course, there were trends for um, clinically meaningful uh, results. So we have some good news. And this is just a, a last slide to show you how intensive is the, uh, the field in terms of clinical trials, all these treatments. Uh, targeting cytokines, the interference uh, pathway, other intracellular pathways, costimulatory molecules, B and T cells, all these clinical studies have been completed or are ongoing, and we expect some um, positive results at least in some of these studies. And this 
um, information has come from the clinical trial uh, point gov site. And the concluding remarks, I think there is extensive and intensive clinical and translational research in the Sjogren's community. Uh, I think we have some effective treatments to reduce overall systemic disease activity, especially uh, this form of Sjogren's disease mediated by B cells and cryoglobulins. Uh, I think we have uh, reliable predictors for mild lymphomas. We need a bigger effort to control patient symptoms, uh, to modify in the long term the disease course and identify possible predictors for the bad uh, histologic type of um, uh, diffuse large B cell. Um, I would like to thank all the research groups for the excellent work they do. And above all, we would like to thank you, our patients, who are the driving force and the inspiration for what we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor. Is there any question? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank so you, much. thank you. So now it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Vasco Romao. Professor Romao is a professor of rheumatology in Lisbon, in Portugal. Okay, there it is. Hi. Hello. They're putting it up. Thank you. Thank you, Coralie. Thank you um, for the invitation. I, I extend my words uh, that Professor Kules also said that it is really a pleasure to be invited by patients. Um, also, Professor Hulis already did most of my job because a lot of the things that I were going to talk about are really new, and he already talked about them. But if, hopefully, uh, thankfully, some of them uh, are, are new also here today. So uh, this is the what I was proposed to, to, to present. Um, something that is now hopefully not so new and it's, it's gonna change, it's this uh, aspect of uh, Sjogren's syndrome or disease. In fact, uh, we are likely uh, turning the name of this uh, disease to where it should have been from the beginning. Um, and this is a very important process that is ongoing where patients' voices is, are really being heard. And, um, and so these are some of the remarks that patients did that uh, patients, other doctors, uh, family members uh, get the idea or the impression that children is mostly a, a nuisance, a collection of symptoms. And that syndrome, the word syndrome, does not really uh, convey the gravity of the disease, more like a, 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 an ensemble of symptoms, and so um, like a flu-like syndrome, and so really not a, a disease itself. Whereas we can actually talk about diseases when we have a better understanding of the etiology and pathogenesis. And, uh, and on this point, I should say that there are even some diseases that this is not even true, and we called it... Um, uh, we don't really understand that well as we do for Sjogren. And just to say an example is undifferentiated connective tissue disease, which is actually a mixture of symptoms, but where we cannot place them in a specific connective tissue disease. But whereas Sjogren is, is very specific. And so um, it, it is indeed a specific disease with specific features, both in terms of clinical features, immunological features, uh, histological parameters, and so on. And so this international task force that is joining uh, patient associations, clinicians all over the world, um, they are under, uh, there is this undergoing process where uh, there is a strong disagreement with the word uh, syndrome. Um, also, um, changing to disease was rather well classified. Uh, most people would agree to keep Sjogren, because then again, this is something that has been, especially in the States, uh, trying to well, overturn, so dropping the eponyms. Uh, but personally, I think it's, it's a good idea to keep it. Um, uh, also, it's even being discussed, should, it's just Sjogren or Sjogren's, uh, which is a thing in, in, uh, in, in, in English, but not maybe in other, uh, uh, in other languages, at least in Portuguese, it's, it's not a thing. Um, but most probably, and, and this is, I think, is very important, uh, to the primary associated, secondary, uh, I mean, in my view, there shouldn't be any. It's just 
children, it's like there's no associated lupus or associated, uh, there are some cases where you have two or even more diseases, but um, there's no reason for Sjogren to be secondary or associated or, or primary, it's just what it is. And so more to follow soon on this. Um, and then also some, some new data that uh, Professor Butsma already presented at uh, EULAR as well, highlighting uh, a big uh, <clears throat> um, genetic risk marker study in Sjogren's. Uh, several markers that are here highlighted in, in, in red and blue, dark blue, were identified. And uh, importantly, uh, patients that have, as most of these diseases, this is not a monogenic disease, meaning that you have, if you have some genes, you will have a higher risk. And this risk, if, it's, uh, if the highest 5% with this risk score have a 12-fold higher risk of developing Sjogren's, as we know, in absolute terms, this will still be a low risk for the person itself, but compared to the general population, it's, it's high. So this, this model, that is true for most uh, autoimmune rheumatic diseases also applies in Sjogren's and more and more we are learning about new risk factors that tell us about the pathology and pathogenesis of the disease itself. Um, then there are some things that, are, uh, there are, that we definitely as clinicians see in clinic. Uh, patients also definitely identify this, which is uh, and now just focusing on the Sika features. Um, there are, and this is very puzzling for us in clinic, uh, and usually when we have fellows or, or from other specialties, we always tell them that this is very heterogeneous, the, the, the symptoms by, uh, and also the objective part, specifically in dryness. And so at this uh, study that was presented in the International Symposium last year in Rome uh, by the French group of Mariette, um, so they, they went and they analyzed patients uh, without uh, uh, dryness in terms of symptoms, and they classify this as having a, a visual score of dryness below 3 out of 10, or and or objective dryness being normal, shimmers, or and uh, uh, salivary flow. And what they saw is that patients without, so they uh, were more or less 10% of patients did not have uh, severe complaints of dryness, so up to a, a VAS of 3 out of 10. And these patients were usually younger, um, so they were younger, they were diagnosed faster, so they had a lower symptom to diagnosis duration. They were more frequently SSA positive, uh, had lower fatigue levels, and had uh, similar uh, SDI and also similar organ involvement. Whereas, and this makes the, the thing even more complicated, patients without objective dryness, so with normal salivary flow or Schirmer tests, this was already around 20% of patients, so twice as much, but just going to the last part, which some of you might not see, but only 17 of these 113 uh, had no subjective dryness. So these are patients that have subjective dryness, but have no uh, subjective, um, have uh, no objective dryness. But these were also younger and uh, had more frequently SS and the SSA, had higher SDI levels, uh, so higher systemic disease activity, had also more arthralgia and, and pain, and generalized pain, uh, similar fatigue and lower uh, dryness scores. So this is, we don't understand why, why this is the case, but this is very important and we see this in clinic. And, um, and so, and this is also something very important to keep in mind in clinical trials, because then if we lump all these patients together, um, we might lose some signals. Um, and also an important thing is what will happen if these patients will transition from one group to the other over time. My impression is that they do uh, over time, especially because as, as it's clear here, these patients are younger. So they are diagnosed early at an earlier age and then they develop. But we do have also uh, some patients that never complain uh, of, of dryness, even though they have all the markers and, and all that. So it's really some, some things are still puzzling us. Um, one thing that was already mentioned here by so the, the work by uh, Professor Fai's group in Newcastle that is also for me very very fascinating to to be able to to in line with this to to, to cluster patients into groups just based on on five uh, symptoms and a few questions um, and so in terms of symptom burden low or high and also if it's dryness or pain dominant uh, with fatigue. And this is not only based on clinical features, 
Uh, this is also based on, on symptom burden. So patients with a uh, high symptom burden have a, a much higher decline in quality of life. And also they have differences in um, specific uh, markers, biological markers. And also, for instance, the patients with dryness dominant with fatigue have lower uh, uh, salivary uh, flow scores, uh, had uh, lower uh, Schirmer scores, and also the patients with low symptom burden had more, uh, uh, sorry, are less uh, lymphopenia. And for instance, uh, patients with uh, pain dominant with fatigue had less uh, SSA or, and or SSB uh, uh, proportion in terms of uh, as a group. And so, and this is also confirmed in terms of transcriptomic signature. So there's a biological correlate here. It's not just symptoms, which is, uh, um, in th well, it is, uh, in a way, it tells us something that the symptoms may actually be related to the pathogenesis of, of, of the disease. And as also, also shown here, we can get uh, some differences in uh, uh, some groups when we analyze, reanalyze some trials, the Joker trial. So this group, high symptom burden, had an improvement on, uh, with hydroxychloroquine, even though all the other groups did not, and the whole trial was very negative. Um, and also the same when reanalyzing the Tractis rituximab trial, uh, another group, so the dryness dominant with fatigue had a difference, also the, the whole trial is, uh, was negative. So this is really um, an important part of the research now, is defining which clusters, and I think this really replicates what we see in clinic, that uh, this is not a, a homogeneous disease, even though the criteria are more or less uh, homogeneous. Um, an interesting uh, study presented at ULAR by Groningen's uh, group um, analyzed uh, interferon uh, signature in vaginal tissue of uh, women who complained of, of vaginal dryness. And they were able to show, compared to, uh, to controls who, who had no dryness, um, that the interferon uh, stimulated genes, so the genes that are uh, involved uh, or are modulated by interferon, which is very important we know in Sjogren's, uh, were appraised, and this was all seen not only here on the on, on the genes themselves, but also uh, at the tissue level. Sorry, at the tissue level with a protein that it's induced by by um, by interferon, and so and this does also give some information regarding uh, a very relevant syndrome, uh, most most of the times undervalued by clinicians or under assessed. So this is also very interesting. It's not yet published, but uh, hopefully it soon will be. Another profile is patients that only have a, a subunit of uh, anti-SSA, so anti-Rho 52 isolated patients. Uh, a poster um, by the Italian group um, pre presented a sub-analysis of, of these patients. And they found that these patients had a mild, milder tissue focal inflammation. So, so they had lower uh, focus scores. Low prevalence of uh, lymphadenopathy, lower prevalence of uh, anti-LA, and uh, lower uh, hyperglobulinemia. Uh, However, they had a higher risk of fibrotic uh, changes, especially fibrotic lung disease, and a higher prevalence of concomitant, uh, concomitant disorders such as uh, primary biliary cholangitis. So we don't know what this is, but again, this is something we see in clinical practice. Um, another, uh, uh, and, and this is always, all very concordant with this cluster definition, is if we define the clusters not in terms of symptoms, but start from the molecular patterns. And, and the Precise Eds Consortium uh, uh, defined this uh, in, and found four clusters, uh, uh, mainly cluster one, which is maybe the more inflamed with higher uh, interference signatures, cluster two, which is more like a healthy, like profile and the lower uh, S dye, and then cluster three or four, which, which are kind of intermediate. And what is interesting to see is that, for instance, uh, S dye is, um, is different between uh, the groups. Of course, here the numbers are very high, even though the differences are, are not. Hyperglobulinemia, for instance, is also uh, much uh, lower in cluster four and two, for instance. And here below, we have uh, anti-SSB, and rheumatoid factor, which are also much lower in cluster two. And again, these are all patients with uh, undoubtedly, uh, undoubt, um, so clear diagnosis of Sjogren's. And, and also, if we reanalyze some, some rituximab uh, uh, data, so we can see that, uh, for instance, in cluster three, 100% of patients 
of the TRACTIS trial responded to rituximab in this cluster. So when we get 100% data, uh, that raises our attention because either it's a mistake or it's something very promising. And so uh, as a whole, again, we are starting to see that reanalyzing trials that are overall negative do, does uh, maybe that's the way to go. And, and, and that's why we see some patients really benefit and others not so much. A recent trial, uh, a recent study that was published focused on another very important thing, which is the so-called seronegative children. So these are patients that do not have anti-SSA or anti-SSB, but they uh, really have all uh, and several features that are very typical of Sjogren's, including positive uh, lip biopsies. And so what they found here is that they, they found uh, 12 new autoantibody uh, specificities, nine of, who, nine of which were commonly found also in, the, in this uh, seronegative uh, Sjogren group. Um, and this uh, binding to, to, to the, at least one of these antigen was identified in about half of the seronegative uh, patients. Um, and so this means that we could, uh, at least with these uh, uh, antigens, and this was validated in, in more than one cohort, find at least half of these so-called seronegative uh, patients. Because sometimes patients really do look like Sjogren's, uh, but, and sometimes we establish the diagnosis without uh, uh, antibodies. But without antibodies, without any features of the salivary glands, without any immunological changes, it is difficult to make the diagnosis. And even though patients may have these symptoms for other reasons, and there are many reasons to have pain and fatigue and, and sicker syndrome. Um, so these are, these are promising data. Let's see if uh, at least some of these autoantibodies uh, can find their way to clinical practice. Um, so we, are, we already heard about the harmonics uh, data uh, with a lot of uh, patients with uh, lymphoma from, the, from, uh, from a fully harmonized data set. And, uh, and so this, this data uh, focus on the presence of cryoglobulinemia and salivary gland swelling as the major factors associated with future uh, lymphoma. Uh, and we will hear more of this uh, soon in, in a paper. Um, a, a very interesting uh, study that was published in, in, in a couple of years ago from Professor Mariette's group they uh, found, uh, studied 24 patients uh, who had lymphoma. And they, instead of doing uh, a parotid biopsy or a lymph node biopsy, which is sometimes difficult or impossible because the nodes are not accessible, they did a more common minor salivary gland biopsy. And in half of those cases, they could reveal the lymphoma there. So, and in 10 of these 13 cases, it was the only site that they could do the diagnosis in. And so this is very uh, important. Uh, so in, in most of these cases were mild lymphomas, um, and, and all of them had a positive biopsy, so this is not uh, surprising. Uh, and, and also importantly, the patients who had lymphoma and had a positive biopsy or not had similar clinical features. Uh, so it was not the biopsy that gave us, uh, not the clinical features that gave us the, the diagnosis, but uh, the diagnosis could be done uh, at least partially with this easily uh, accessible uh, technique. And, uh, and so this is the message that they, they have. So this is one of the important things that patients sometimes ask us. So I already have the diagnosis. Do I really need the biopsy? In Lisbon, we uh, offer and, and, and perform the biopsy to every patient with a diagnosis or suspicion of a diagnosis for several reasons. One of them is, is, is listed here. So sometimes the patient comes to us and uh, it's the first diagnosis or they have already had the diagnosis for 10 years, but then maybe 10 years from then we will have a, a doubt. And so we will, it will be very important to have a, a baseline to compare to. This is one reason. The other reason is that sometimes we find uh, by chance is not common, but we can find a mild lymphoma there. And also, or the, also diseases. So for instance, sarcoidosis can, can come up. And just recently I had a case like that, uh, which then makes what, what is going on here. Um, but usually, and being uh, uh, you know, in a setting where we are used to doing it, it is a safe technique. And I'm just sharing a case of a patient that of ours, um, a 64-year-old woman that in 2015 uh, complained with uh, dry eyes and dry mouth, and then a year, a year later, very important body weight loss, uh, persistent parotid swelling in, in a couple of years later, and then purpura, uh, so vasculitis of the skin, and arthritis. Uh, 
Interestingly, she was anti-Rho52 positive, uh, isolated, and anti-Syndromere positive. And she had a, a biopsy done, this was in France in 2016, with a posit which was very positive. Then she came to Portugal well, after she retired, and she had uh, an ultrasound, which was also very uh, revealing of Sjogren's. She had a low Shermer and a very low salivary flow. And then, um, back before coming to, to Portugal, because she was having this persistent parotid, uh, left parotid swelling, she did a biopsy of the parotid, and, and they diagnosed with marginal zo zone malt lymphoma. And so she did uh, rituximab, this was under the hematology, uh, and she had a good response. But then she comes back a year later with persistent swelling, so not persistent, but it came back. And uh, the hematologist uh, didn't know if it were, if it were uh, Sjogren's or mouth lymphoma. And so we were discussing what is it. And what we do, based on this study, is we did a minor salivary gland biopsy, because in our setting it is not easy to do the parotid uh, biopsy. And then the minor salivary gland biopsy confirmed these features of uh, mouth lymphoma. Uh, both uh, histopathologically, also from the molecular point of view. And so we sent her to the Oncology Institute, and she did rituximab plus chemotherapy, and she has been ever since in remission of, of the lymphoma. And so this is an ex a practical example of how a, public, a paper can then change our clinical practice uh, uh, back home. Um, another technique that... Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> no problem, because most of the studies have already been, been spoken. So this has been also addressed. So the, the group in Italy uh, under the, going under ultrasound-guided core biopsies. Um, and so this has been shown to be effective in diagnosing both lymphocyalodenitis and also uh, lymphoma. And has been safe and uh, well tolerated by patients. And this is a not so spoken uh, technique, which is elastography. So it, it evaluates the stiffness of the glands. It's usually used by, by, for liver disease. And the study from Portugal, uh, from the Queen group, group, found that these patients had increased uh, stiffness in the parotids and salivary glands, um, which associated with this uh, ultrasound score, but not with disease duration. So it means fibrosis, probably. Uh, I'm going to skip this part, which is on, on lymphoma. Also, STAR was already presented, so this is a very promising tool, and that is being assessed in the necessity uh, consortium. And I'm going to focus on treatment. So we already, uh, they have been published for a couple of years, even though the final publication was only last year. But the ULA recommendations are uh, guiding us for oral symptoms, um, uh, ocular symptoms, and also uh, specific gland um, organ involvement. So treatment is still not uniform, and, and it's based on uh, uh, which organ is involved. But these recommendations are mostly based on uh, low low grade evidence and expert opinion. At the time, there were uh, there weren't any positive uh, sugar and trials. Um, just a, a, a quick mention of something that is also uh, not so not so frequently spoken, which is. Uh, uh, the, and of course, we need the oral medicine uh, uh, experts here to, 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 to do this. And in our case, uh, we have a collaboration with the oral medicine where they do irrigation of the parotid glands with saline and glucocorticoids. And this is a procedure that can be repeated up a few weeks. Um, and it, it improves <clears throat> in about 10% uh, the symptoms uh, and also the, the objective dryness. For, and this is for patients with very severe dryness where we cannot uh, offer uh, uh, much else. And so 10%, I think it's already uh, good. And uh, more irrigations uh, had a more pronounced uh, reduction in symptoms. Another point focused by Professor Butzma and Ular, uh, is that only 20 to 30% are, are eligible for trials. So this is a very big issue. This is being overcome by the uh, trials, including patients with low s dyes. But still, uh, I mean, then you see how many patients are left out. Um, but we are indeed seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And after a very dark age, we started having uh, positive or somewhat positive trials. And now we have definite positive trials, which are already presented here. So the repurposed trial with uh, liflonamide was a very small trial, but still very positive, And this was very exciting. Um, the Scalimab trial. Uh, the phase two trial was also positive with a difference in S diet, but no differences in ESPRI, unfortunately. And the Yanolumab trial 
<clears throat> was also positive, and these trials are all, all in phase three uh, 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 as we speak. And uh, Justin Euler, in the last couple of slides, uh, two new trials were presented. Uh, so the, the two trials uh, on the Dazodalibap uh, uh, drug, which, is, which will target CD40 ligand. And these trials were very uh, exciting because they had two populations and both met their primary endpoints. And so one of them was the systemic disease activity. And then this population, which is very common in clinical practice, had a huge effect on uh, ESPRI, which was not seen up until now, uh, at least with this degree. And finally, telitacicept, so I have to read this slowly, uh, which is a, a, a bliss April uh, inhibitor, and also had, this was a, a small study, improvements in uh, SDI, uh, ESPRI not so much, but then uh, uh, the very interesting increase in salivary flow, and in Shermer, which is something that does not change much, at least in our experience. Here in the big dose, in 240, they had an increase in Shermer's. So these are the promising and exciting results, and thanks again for inviting and for attention. Thank you, thank you so much. Any question? Yeah. Um, are the genetic markers bared by the X chromosome, mostly? Hmm. And uh, those genetic markers, are they correlated to any stratification? Um, so these genetic markers, uh, they are not all, uh, mostly they are not related to the X chromosome. There is uh, uh, another mechanism, which I don't think it's well studied in Sjogren's, but it is in lupus, which is the inactivation of the X chromosome. Um, but these are mostly uh, r identifying risk to, to develop children. So they get hundreds of thousands of patients, or at least tens of thousands of patients. We usually have to have a lot of, lot of, a lot of patients, very big numbers, and they get uh, uh, markers that are very, very overexpressed compared to people that do not have the, this, this disease. And then you have to see the markers as a whole. So it's very difficult to then, uh, then stratify per prognosis and so on. So this is mostly, this highlights the nature of the disease. Of course, if we get a big signal of a, of a gene, we're going to look what does this gene do. And then if we see if it's very important for a specific cell, T cells or B cells, then maybe we get into it. Uh, but usually it doesn't allow us to then stratify because we're already operating and there's such big numbers that uh, it's, it's, it's a hard thing technically to do. But it's very important to understand more about the disease and, uh, and also eventually treatments. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Roma. Thanks. Um, now it's time to welcome Soren Skovland. Sorry for the pronunciation. So, Soren is Senior Director and Head of Patient uh, Engagement at uh, Patient Centered Research in Denmark. Thank you, Soren. Uh, let, me, let me ask from, from the speakers, all of the speakers, to have the time, to respect the time and not pass the time of the speech because they are stealing time from the other speakers. We have to be very strict to the time schedule. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I see four minutes uh, late start. <laughs> I'll try to make something up maybe. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. So. Um, Thank you so much to the organizers for in inviting me to speak. I will slow down the pace, perhaps a little bit of the presentations. We've got some very, very informative, high level uh, clinical research presentations. I will shift topic to talk about patient, uh, patient partnering in research. And, um, and I will talk in a very humble way because I'm not a Sjögren's expert, but I'm a behavioral and patient-centered research expert. Um, and, and, um, and we have begun to work in the field of Sjögren's and rare diseases only um, uh, recently. So now I'm going to make sure I press the right green button here. Uh, let me see. Yes. So I'll talk about patient research partners in clinical research and more in general and, lo and look at the methods to protect the patient's voice in the process of drug and technology innovation and perspectives on patient partnering in Sjögren's disease and 
my some advocacy points for me on on the importance of of of, of keeping this in focus uh, from all stakeholders' perspectives. I would just want to clarify, I work within uh, EBIDERA, which is a global patient-centered research organization that's part of a global clinical research group. And so I'm just making clear that I'm speaking on, on my own opinions and not a, of the broader organization's opinions here. Um, so just a little bit about me. I'm, I've, I've worked my whole adult career uh, heading up international patient-centered research, predominantly in diabetes, obesity, hemophilia, other areas, not in, not in rare diseases before recently. But many of these principles can be applied. Um, and I head up a team of, of research scientists. We are part of a group of 140 patient-centered research scientists specialized in identifying the most effective ways of bringing patients in as equal partners in clinical research and, and technology development and combining that with patient-centered science like patient-reported outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that's really the focus of my, my, my area. And I did a, a, my doctorate on patient partnering in health research on a national program with the Danish government on diabetes. And uh, I actually have a parent with Sjögren's disease myself. So I have followed these as aspects from, from, from in. So I won't go into detail on um, uh, uh, on, the, um, on the, those perspectives as, as much now. Uh, I do want to give a, a strong acknowledgement to uh, the board members of Sjögren Europe because in, in preparation for this meeting, um, me and my colleague uh, who is uh, heading up uh, our rare disease engagement activities, we talked with the Sjögren Europe and got a lot of important input on the perspective and, and, the, uh, and the current approaches to being research partners in Sjögren. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I w as I said, I won't discuss the details of my own caregiver experience now. It's not the topic. But I do think it is important that we are uh, reflecting on the, on the insights and expertise that all of us have in so many forms and shapes that we bring into our work as researchers, as advocates, and so forth. And I have experienced many of these things as a caregiver of my elder parent um, on this. And, uh, and the journey continues. Um, and this is in Denmark, it was supposed to have a highly, highly well-developed health system. It's certainly not um, where it should be when it comes to caring for people with circling. I can, I can say that up front. So patient partnering in research, what does that mean? It, it means equal collaboration with people who have the experience of living with a disease or represent people with a disease and involving them in all the stages of the research process. And the, uh, what does a research partner do? Well, a, a patient research partner can contribute in many different ways, as I will discuss. They can attend meetings. They can review documents. They can lead the projects, lead sub-projects. They can continuously be an aspiring partner. Um, and everybody can be a patient research partner because there are many shapes and forms. There's no specific requirement um, for this. This term is not um, um, a fixed term, by the way. It's something we use in the, while, we are, while the field is developing a proper uh, terminology. Um, so the value of patient partnering, I will get back to, to that in the talk as well. But, but we know from, from increasing research on the benefits of patient partnering, we know that there is a value. And there are publications that begin to demonstrate also to sponsors um, in the case that the sponsors are not aware, that there's actually both monetary and, and humanistic value of involving patients in your research. Because, uh, and I'll get back to, to, to some of the examples of this. So patients play diverse roles in, in Sjögren's research. And this is looking at this continuum. And I apologize for the, for the, for the, for the small font. I'll read it up. Uh, but, but it's really a continuum from anyone who is part of a, who's a study participant is contributing very actively to contribute with data and information. And, and people can contribute as reviewers of, of materials, of documents. They can con contribute as advisors. Is this a good design? Is this a bad design? Is this, is this going to work in the real world? For, are people going to be, 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 be accepting this? study for the duration, uh, partners working collaboratively to, to ensure that this study is created, executed, and communicated 
to the best possible impact for the communities. And, that, so, and then co-leaders or leaders. This is a, a powerful, I think this, in, this initiative today and the work of the Sjögren is a very impressive example of the power of, of patient advocacy groups. And we are, we are working as an, as, in my organization as, an, as a scientific uh, um, partner with the COPD Respiratory Foundation on their global effort to establish core patient-centered outcomes for use with the regulatory and to accelerate the whole approval in respiratory conditions. So they, they, are, they, are, they are the patient advocacy group that decides everything. We are the scientific support for the patient-centered research part and trying to create some consortium model that it has a strong governance that leverages the medical professions, the researchers, and, and sponsors needs in, 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 one, in, one, in one setting. And I see some great initiatives in, in Sjögren on that front as well. So patient partnering is, is really, has really come on the map. This is a picture from the European Medicines Agency uh, big meeting last year on patient experience data and patient engagement. So executives from public authorities, from FDA, from patient advocacy groups across Europe, European Patient Foundation Forum and so forth, all meeting one very clear message from the executive director and others, patient engagement, patient partnering, as well as patient reported data, both are increasingly important and requested from authorities in order to swiftly and effectively approve um, uh, medicines. So the more we can work together to establish really robust patient voice integration in our research, the more successful we, we will be in, in getting a new treatments, new diagnostic methods, new care out to the people who need it. So benefits of patient partnering in research, I'm aware that there are some excellent uh, speakers in front of me talking about this more specifically to Sjögren, so I will talk more quickly on general terms on this and, um, and leave some of the thunder for, for, for those. But I think benefits of patient partnering, well, first of all, it's an ethical democratic issue of, of, of the people who are, who are the fo focus of all the efforts and the investments that they are part of the, of the process. The key is that we, are, that, it, that we need to ensure that all the investments that go to research, they are aligned with patient priorities. So if, if timely diagnosis is a critical matter, are we ensuring that, there, that, the, that there's research going to, to, the right, to that in the right way and so forth? And then it's about, by, in, by being involved as a patient advocacy groups as you are in, in, in research, well, it's an educational process of empowering the, the broader patient community uh, to be even stronger in the next trial that one's a part of. And overall, as I mentioned, the, the involvement, the collaborative approach will help ac accelerate the access to new uh, diagnostic tests or new medicines because if we, if we initiate a lot of big trials that haven't been thought through from the patient's perspective, what happens is often you have need for protocol amendments, you get stuck halfway in enrollment, you cannot recruit patients, or you, you get suboptimal results. So uh, that will delay the whole research process. So um, there has been some publications out looking at what is actually the value of, of involving patient partners. 16% in, increase in recruitment, of course that's an average number that doesn't really make sense for an individual trial, but it just shows that uh, we have pooled data here. Greater, ensuring greater diversity, ensure that all the different types of people that are affected by sugarcane are actually considered in the studies. So we have data that represent the broad variety in the, in the community. Avoid the protocol amendments, and, and especially protocol amendments are hugely expensive to sponsors. So, if that is a, so that's one place where there can be a, a, a projected significant uh, return on investment as, um, of this. So, um, so how do we do it? So how do we then in incorporate patient partners in clinical research? Well, uh, many of you are probably familiar with all these letters on the left side. Some of them, some are not. It looks like Scrabble. Uh, but this is Eurotis, uh, Eupati, PFMD, Paradigm, Isoms, uh, PCORI. 
they are all global and or international organizations. I've been involved with many of them. You, Patsy, I was part of initiating together with a lot of uh, people um, in the EU IMI project, which is aimed at supporting, uh, providing training and education for, um, uh, for patients in Europe so they can be more actively engaged in, as research partners. PFMD, uh, same principle, global international guidances and tools a very, very appealing uh, website with resources for everyone just to go in and use now. There are tr online trainings. Paradigm, equally so, they have developed, uh, that's also a big EU program that developed a lot of very concrete tools, exactly how-to tools, stepwise actions that you can take as a patient or as a, as a, as a researcher for involving patients. Um, so a ton of work has been done by in collaboration between patient groups, industry, researchers, and authorities to really make it as easy as possible. But it's still difficult. But some of the key messages that are in these guidelines, um, I can speak to as, as co-developer of the PFMD guidelines that, that, that we are using. It's first of all, defining patient partnering as early, ongoing, meaningful, equal collaboration in all the stages of the research making sure that the perspectives and the needs of the patients uh, in focus are considered in the decision-making process of the research. Um, and then there are, uh, in the guidances, a lot about the importance of clear roles and responsibilities because you come in with very diverse uh, um, uh, opportunities for, for engagement. So clear roles and responsibilities, clear compensation for your time as a patient research partner, the support needed, transparency in communication. And one thing that we are very focused on right now is evaluation. So making sure at each research project that we evaluate, did we do this right? What, what was the added value of involving uh, patients? Not because we question it, but because we want to make sure we do it better next time. And we want to make sure we can argue for more investments into patient partnering because it, it does require time. And we need to ensure that that's budgeted when you start a new trial. There's a budget post that says effective, meaningful, quality assured patient partnering budget. And then you say, what, do you, what is it required here to ensure that those patient partners have somebody to talk to to, to get, guide that process? And that's all about sustainability and ensuring that after these patient partners that were part of one study, well, there will probably be a need for new partners to come that needs to be trained and supported and, the, and, and, and people get worn out with your volunteers, it's a limit to how much you can keep going at it. I'm not saying that that's a good thing, but I'm saying the system has to be sustainable and we have to care for everybody and make sure that, that nobody is put in a position where they feel they are forced to just keep going at being a partner, helping research because there's nobody coming after them to, to take the baton. So those, are, so those are some critical principles that I was, was keen to share with you. And just to a very quick glimpse um, uh, into how we work in, in patient-centered research in Evidera, it's we are combining patient-centered research science, which is typical, which is understanding the patient's perspective on unmet needs, patient-identified clinical outcomes, barriers to clinical research, understanding meaningful benefit, understanding the benefit risk from the patient's perspective understanding the opportunities to improve the dialogue, the shared decision-making at the point of care in the clinic, and, and overall understand the burden of disease. So we are conducting research around all this using qualitative and quantitative research, but we are aware that patients need to be involved in that research as partners. So, so we are trying to combine those two elements and, and do that in alignment with regulatory authorities and and, and, um, and, 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 um, and pay us in order to ensure that there's the, the evidence needed once the, the, the new medicines are developed for, to get it quickly out in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the community. So what did we learn from the engagement with the, with the board as well as, as, uh, as other insights? We already now, there are good examples of patient partner contributions in circulants research all the way from protocol design endpoints, quality of life questionnaires, minimizing patient burden in trials, reviewing informed consent forms, considering reimbursements, 
ensuring materials are accessible for patients. These are really important activities, and they are being um, and and so this is this, these are important. So some of the highlighted activities were the transformation of informed consent forms, uh, adjustments to trial structures, reducing impact of hospital visits, um, making previously mandatory invasive procedures optional, um, and uh, and in that way. These things are, are really significant, and we could even put in some more research to emphasize the benefit of this for, for future research, and we should continue to make this a cornerstone of, of how we work. Furthermore, um, yeah, so I think in, in, in uh, well, I'm actually ahead of time, because I, I and, and don't worry, I could, I, could, I could speak for the rest of the day if, I, if you don't stop me, but but um, I'll slow down a little bit, but I will, I will still hit the mark, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, so, um, yeah, so I wanted to say also that, that the involvement of patients in a collaborative manner is a promotion of ethical and inclusive research practices. I'm not saying that researchers, I myself a researcher, are not ethical and inclusive, but by, work, by having that collaborative set up in the research studies, you automatically, it's, it sounds like a really bad Hollywood line, but you make each other better because you, um, you constantly challenge each other and learn from each other and, and, and are constantly connected to the mission of the research, which is the end, the end user. And you can actually lose sight of that when you're a, a research team because the, the numbers and the statistics are so fascinating that, that you just focus on all that. And if you don't have regular meetings where you talk to the patient community, and talk about this, and they say, wow, this is great. And, oh, you should look more into this, or this is, this is just the wrong way to go. Well, it, it's a way of keeping things on, on, the, um, on the right track. So, um, so um, some of the thoughts that I had, and these are general, general, uh, general thoughts. Some of them may actually already be implemented, so I will apologize on the, uh, in advance if I step on anyone's toes. I know that you're doing a lot of great work. I've spoken to, 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 to people in the board and very impressed. But some of the things that I, we, that I generally think is really important is that quality patient partnering should be a standard in clinical research. And a, road, and a roadmap for all parties, whether it's researchers, sponsors, or patient advocacy groups for just saying, okay, we've got a new study, this is a standard, and I think, I think we are very close to, to getting this in, but, but the tools, resources are there to, to do it and ensure that both researchers, patients, and sponsors are trained in quality partnering and have the needed skills and insights to combine the, the relevant partnerships with the patient experience data, recognizing that resources are often limited. So, so it's not about saying that we have to do a million things. Patient partnering can be limited to certain small engagements because you don't have endless funds. We all know that. We all know that we have to prioritize and we have to think smart about making, doing things that make sense. So, so think smart about how to do it in each study in a smart way and, and recognize that patient research have, partners have own health situations and time constraints. One of my partners in the team, they're just publishing a paper on the emotional burden it can be for pa patient partners to travel and, and participate again and again and again. And, and, and there needs to be a support network and a, and a care for, for people who put out them, themselves so much for this, good, for this course. Um, and I think um, one of the things that we are excited about is work, is we just launched the patient advocacy a patient partnering council yesterday in my team, and, and we, are, we are looking at new projects to bring uh, patient advocates together across related diseases like Sjögren and others to understand uh, how, can we, how can we improve things together so we don't reinvent the wheel in every, every rare disease. And we sort of say there are many other rare diseases that have the same value and principles as, as you have. And let's make sure we, we align and think about how to do this in an efficient way uh, with a broad voice. So patient partnering is uh, invaluable and can be increased. Resources, tools, guidances exist already for patients, sponsors, and researchers. We will see examples coming up now, I'm sure. And, and I think by 
our approach is really combining patient-centered research and patient partnering as two of the two sides of the coin. It's a really important part. So people with circulating is equal partners and key catalysts for scientific innovation with engagement of all the stakeholders. That's my 10 cents um, for, for, for today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Seren. I might... <clears throat> I have a, a remark. It's not a question, it's a remark. Okay. We, we as patients, when we collaborate with teams, we also appreciate to be acknowledged or um, quoted as quote or when there's manuscripts. And it's not always the case. So sometimes it's good also to mention that we are not doctors, but we might collaborate to write a paper and we should be acknowledged for, for that. So it was just... A, uh, a remark. Yes, could, but I will comment on it anyways, if it's, a, if it's okay. I, th I think that's a really important remark. I also <laughs> want to remark that Daniel Dragman, my team member, um, I was doing this myself, but she actually contributed um, with input, and I put her on the first slide. I forgot to mention her name. So thank you for that. Uh, but, uh, but it is very important. It is very important. That's a question. That's a question. Hi, Christina Davidson from Amgen. I uh, focus on patient advocacy. And one, uh, and I, I have to say I'm embarrassed to not have thought of this before, but we, you know, all of industry has patient advisory panels or things like this, bringing patients together and talking about the clinical trial. But one of the things that we talked about was publishing the findings of those. So maybe the learnings that we have and the burden that patient, you know, that people with these diseases, their carers have in trying to give us feedback. Mm. It takes time, it takes energy. We as industry should make that public. So maybe our other industry partners can um, learn something and you know continue asking questions. But I really like that idea and I'm going to bring it back. Wonderful, wonderful, thank do you, you so much. Do you have any experience in working with industry or, or in, uh, that have done that? Uh, um, with industry, yeah, well, yes, I've been part of all these industry groups, both from the industry side and then from the, from the academia side. So, yes, I do, and we, uh, we are publishing, we are coming out with a paper very soon, and, and it's a powder, transparent process to really take this up. So, I'd be very happy to, to uh, share some of that with you that may help the internal discussion. Thank you so much, and thank you for your work. Thank you. I, I just wanted to follow up on that because I think it's a really important point uh, about the publications and like really uh, collaborating together. And I just wanted to point out that in the scleroderma research, which is one of my main foci, um, there was a very nice paper first authored by a patient organization uh, uh, and patient advocates together with uh, uh, different industries on how they would envision collaborating in research. And uh, it's a very nice framework on how you can think about that. And it's a reference, almost like a manual on agreements uh, on uh, how they would like to collaborate, and that's been uh, published as well. So I think that would be a very nice uh, idea also for uh, for the Sjogren's Europe. Yeah. We'll, we'll one, see. One last here, maybe? Yeah, okay. in the front. definitely. <coughs> last one. Thank you for your presentation. I didn't see you mentioning you are uh, in those you party and uh, you wrote this you you did the list uh, you didn't mention you are maybe you know i'm sure that yes. you know but i don't know if the patient know that uh, you are uh, has this uh, patient research partner uh, program and there are uh, i don't know how many but uh, trained patient research partners yes. Me, me and Andre, we are also patient research partners and we collaborate in uh, developing guidelines or other papers and uh, we are acknowledged, as you said. Uh, so, and there is an online course on uh, UR School of Rheumatology on the website that uh, every patient can, uh, can, can follow. It is paid course, but it's not so yeah. much... Uh, so I, I know it, and it's, it should have been on the list. It's, there's no reason why it's not. The only reason is that it was, um, it's a list of, very, uh, of the main generic, broader 
uh, guideline areas. Uh, so, yeah, so, but this is this is highly relevant and it's a very impressive program. Yeah, Euler is more specific. Yes. Yes, but as Sjogren's is part of, of course. The rheumatic diseases, that's why I I, I mentioned I Euler. So, thank if you. Anybody is interested, you can uh, contact the Euler secretariat and ask. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Soren. It's, it was an interesting presentation. And let's have now Mr. Uh, Lucas, Hadzis Lucas, who is going to speak and to present us the patient's contribution from clinician perspective. Lucas is a scholar, university academic scholar, Department of Pathophysiology, School of Medicine, National and Capodistrian University of Athens. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I should give you a warm welcome in the sunny and wonderful Athens. It's my hometown. Let me introduce myself. I'm Lukas Hadzis, that is this called in Greek. I'm an uh, academic fellow at the Department of Pathophysiology at the University of Athens, which is just around the corner from where we are today. Uh, and in the last seven years, I have been actively involved in taking care patients with Sjogren, and I also conduct research, both basic and clinical, for the disease under the supervision of Professor Athanasios Giufas. First of all, before I start, just let me uh, clear out that today, speaking in front of my patients, I can see some familiar faces, speaking in front of your patients, speaking in front of the Sjogren's community, makes me more anxious than ever. <laughs> Having said that, let me start. Today we're going to, I will uh, keep the previous gear and talk about a project called New Clinical Endpoints in Patients with Primary Sugar Syndrome, an interventional trial based on stratifying patients. Uh, <laughs> it's coordinated by Professor Xavier Mariette and known with the acronym NECESSITY, focusing on the patient's contribution and the plethora of ways it has already shaped and it is going to shape the fate of the project. And it is a special project with many collaborators. It is funded both by the European Union and the pharma industry, and it is constituted, the consortium is constituted by university partners, by four big pharma industries, and also, of course, by represented, representing the Sjogren disease patients, the association of patients from, the, from France, the France Association of Patients with Sjogren's. So in order for the project to succeed, we should all work together, hand in hand, and this is not easy, including academics from 20, 20 institutions across Europe, including industriers from four big pharma companies, and of course patients from Europe and the United States whose voices are echoed through the eight-member patient advisory board. If we want to fulfill the mission of the project, and what is the mission? First of all, finding, identifying new biomarkers for the disease. Biomarkers that will help us, help us discriminate, will help us stratify patients into smaller groups that share common characteristics and probably apply specific treatments in these groups. Remember the work from FIGHT has already been mentioned two times, stratifying patients according to symptoms. Then, we sh in the context of necessity, we are trying to develop new clinical endpoints. As you all know, there has been no treatments for Sjogren. And one of the, of the reasons for that is that we do not have good or we have limited number and um, uh, clinical endpoints with limitations. And lastly, we should set up and perform a new clinical study using drugs that have already been used and also assessing and validating the biomarkers and clinical endpoints previously de developed in the context of the project. I should be honest. In each and every step of this way, it would be impossible to do anything without the patient's contribution. Even before the start of the project, during the preparation of the proposal, ensuring that the project is patient-centered, responsive to real-world needs, and well-respected among the Sjogren's patient community. And this is very important for the European Union to see that the project 
is going to be successful. As far as clinical endpoints are concerned, it would be impossible to find successful clinical endpoints without the insight and perspectives from the patient's point of view. Patients have already raised awareness about the project in different flora, including political and social. And right now, there is the clinical trial ongoing, as mentioned previously. We need a lot of patients, 300 patients, and we it would be impossible to find that number without the help of the patients, without the help of the patient associations. Finally, looking forward at the future, communicating the successful results of the project in other patients, in the patient's family, in the general public, is also of the utmost importance. So, all in all, necessity project would be impossible to be successful without your help. And it is high time we give a permanent seat in the table to our patients and start listening, osculating, not only their lungs and hearts, but their opinions, the way they think, the way th their mind, their mindset. And I will give you two tangible examples during the process of necessity. You all know the ESSDI, it was mentioned earlier. It is a composite index reflecting disease activity and also response to treatment in all clinical trials. However, our patients have repeatedly told us that it lacks sensitivity, it is only relevant for those patients who have medium or high disease activity, and there are not many, 20%, 30%. The glandular function is not included, and also it doesn't measure symptomatic involvement. So in the last 10 to 15 years, we in the clinic face a very, very often we face the following paradox or oxymoron. Both of these are Greek words. The doctor used to be happy because the score was very, very low. It can get no lower, zero ESS die, yeah. But the patient was not. The patient felt helpless, being really dry, ha having the disease, in getting like uh, he, her everyday or his everyday life was really disrupted by the disease. And the bridge between the patient and the doctor was full of crackles. The connection is lost. So what did we do? We tried to find a new clinical endpoint called STAR, Sjogren tool for assessing response to treatment. And patient contribution was incremental. 20 patients were included in the, in, 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 in the making of the, of the STAR. As you can see, yes, systemic involvement is included, of course, but it goes far beyond patient reported outcomes. The most important thing is included. Lacrimal and salivary gland function is included, and of course, the biological domain. So let's now jump to the second paradigm regarding the clinical study. Disease-modifying drugs and Sjogren's, no relation. No drug has been approved or has shown efficacy in everyday clinical practice. And this is probably one of the reasons for this is that the disease is very complicated and complex. There are a lot of cells involved Epithelial cells seems to play a crucial role, but also invading B and T cells. But there is a glimpse of hope, as mentioned previously, with some drugs that target both B and T cells or their interaction. This is the rationale behind the treatment selection for the clinical study in Sjogren's. We use drugs, we repurpose drugs that have already been used, have already been used for many years in other diseases in combination, hydroxychloroquine, which targets B cells, leflunomide, and mycophenolide targeting T cells. So we give these drugs together. But what is the difference? In all the previous RCTs, randomized clinical trials, patients were included if they had moderate or high systemic activity, an ESS die of equal or above five. But most of the patients are excluded. Imagine being a patient, having no disease-modifying drugs. Your symptoms are relieved in a medium way, but just symptoms relief. Your connection to the doctor is lost. And your ability to take part in any clinical trial is non-existent. 
So this is the difference with the necessity trial. We try, after listening to our patients, we try to enroll all patients, irrespective of the ESSDI. So we have two cohort population. One can be included with an ESSDI below five, and in the other, with an ESSDI above five. So all patients are included. The only one that is excluded is patients who have a low ESSDI, and the low ESSDI is pre. That means a very low symptomatic burden. These are only the patients that are excluded. So that's, f that's all from me. I hope I was not long enough. Uh, if, if, uh, I just want to say that doctors and patients should work together as a team. That's the most important thing. It is an honor, a great honor speaking today in the first annual conference of my patients, of Sjogren syndrome patients. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Luca. Lucas, because the tone is in us, <laughs> not Lucas. It's Lucas in Greek. Lucas yes. In Greek. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. No, no, there, 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 there is a question, yeah. You have oh. It's not a question, but uh, for necessity, we went up to, from the patient group, to writing a letter to the email, a letter for, uh, from the patients, and it was very well accepted by the email. So it's important that the patient show themselves to the health authorities. They are very welcome. Uh, exactly, health authorities love, and that is, that is how it should be. They respect patient's opinion. Thank you. Do we have any other question or remark? Okay, thank you very much, Lucas. And now, our Coralie Buillo, <laughs> the, the, the General Secretary of our association, is going to present us the patient's perspective from within necessity. So, Coralie, the floor is yours. Hi again. <laughs> okay, that's me, very quickly. And just um, so uh, many, many points have already been uh, said by my uh, predecessor, which is a good thing, because we will go quick. So you probably all understood that the main objective of necessity was to, to identify and validate new clinical endpoints, discover biomarkers, and validate them in a new uh, clinical trials. So something uh, very important for us uh, patients is that, that multidisciplinary approach in a public and private project. So as you can see, but Lucas already uh, presented 25 partners, 10 countries, and one patient, patient association. So um, project started in 2019, but we will probably probably extend the project for one year due to the, the COVID pandemic. So eight, eight countries, eight patients. Um, since the beginning, the interactions between the medical staff, medical team, uh, in necessity was guided by interaction with patients. I think that has, it has been said a lot. But again, willing to respond to, to unmet needs of patients. So there's statements, patient opinion are crucial, uh, increasing patient engagement, patient views uh, are crucial again. But these statements were written in the project before submission by the uh, investigator. And that is one of the great <coughs> achievements to my point of view in patient partnership. So the patient advisory group include eight patients, so one from, uh, for every country. Um, some of them are here, 
So uh, I send them on behalf of the, of the, the PAG. The PAG is coordinated by, by France, by the French Association. And again, we, the, the French Association has a, a strategic role to identify um, the, the, the partner, the patient partner in the project again in, uh, in the beginning before submission. So concretely, the, the necessity project is organized in 10 different work package, and the patients are involved in six of them, which is obviously a very important role uh, for us. And we, um, as Lucas said earlier, we do a great work and we try to do a great work on communication and dissemination uh, towards uh, uh, general public uh, and also every, every patient and stakeholder as it has been said uh, toward uh, other um, patients and scientific organization and health uh, authorities, of course. So really concretely for you to, 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 to understand, um, here uh, you will find the detailed involvement uh, the work package where, uh, where we are not are the, the package uh, very technical and scientific ones where we won't have any uh, added value as patients. So uh, I won't detail, uh, uh, but we are in the most important one. So basically what we have done so far as a patient association, as coordinating uh, the, the patient uh, group. So basically, uh, we do a really active uh, advo advocacy role in this project. So as the voice of the large uh, Jogren community with disparities in care in Europe, even within our uh, patient uh, partners, um, so we have been active in participating in meeting, in supporting and promoting the project to the general public. We communicate as much as we as we can, as we can towards the Federation of Rare Disease, towards scientific organization, ULAR, uh, Eurordis, and uh, of course, and as Maggie said, health authorities just like EMA and liaison with uh, the United States. <coughs> so I don't know, it might be a, a bit small. Um, so that is the patient involvement in the development of STAR. Uh, we have been talking about STAR a lot since the beginning of this, uh, this afternoon. It's, it, was just, it was just to show you that as a culmination of the first phase, 20 patients provided uh, valuable input to ensure that the validated clinical endpoints are relevant for patients. So we raised, we raised issues that I, has not been uh, considered fully previously. So the opinion expressed by patients during the Delphi, uh, the big, that one, the big Delphi um, was, sorry, I've got a problem. Uh, so the patient opinion contributed to uh, this evaluation tool and um, from uh, Professor Serror and colleagues in, uh, Raphael says in the paper, this future gold standard could not have been developed without patients. And that's what uh, I was saying to Soren earlier. That's what is important also for us as patient partner is to be recognized and acknowledged uh, in our role. And that is the case within the, the necessity global, uh, global team. So the different step of the STAR development where, where we were included, I won't detail uh, them again, but you can see just highlighted patients' symptoms in, uh, in yellow. And I really think, and we all think as patient partner, that is a huge step for PRO's inclusions in research. I mean real PRO's, patients reported outcomes, but our views and patient symptoms are now inside the, the star and it's a, it's a great achievement for the, the patient group. So again, you, you are probably all familiar with SDI Esprit. I won't get back uh, to, to this again to assess the disease. 
Um, today, uh, we, um, in this clinic, uh, will... In this clinical trial, the primary outcome measure is usually based on, on SDI. Tomorrow, for us, what it means if STAR is endorsed and validated by the international community, we will have PROs in the primary outcomes. Again, it's a huge step towards a different clinical trial with only SDI uh, taken into account. So just to summarize uh, our participation as patient in this, uh, in this project and what we are and what we have, we have a valuable voice. We feel and we are considered as real partner. We think we are a precious help and time saving for clinicians for all the reasons we already spoke with, uh, with Lucas, Soren and, and, and all. Um, so the words partner, corrections at early stage are really, again, really important and we continuously raise awareness about our quality of life and uh, we really think that it is needed and expected by the patients and by the clinician. The unmet needs within this project are constantly monitored and brought uh, on the table. So this is a global conclusion of involvement in patient in research. Uh, it's a paper that has been selected in uh, last uh, EULA, which has been accepted, again, as recognition of our work as patient partner. So we can definitely work together, bearing in mind our differences. We are not professional, just like you, but we do it professionally. So uh, go on. Involve yourself in research. Let's uh, continue and uh, to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Coralie. Do do you have any questions? Yes. Let's go ahead for them. Uh, thanks, Coralie. Um, so Noel from Janssen. Um, I think we all agree that necessities is. is a very good example of how things should be done. And thank you, Coralie, for highlighting how much patient involvement was crucial um, in this project. Um, but I think necessity stands out for two other reasons, also from an industry perspective. One, it's not one partner or two partners, patients, industry. There's the third partner of the, the, the payer and the, the, the regulator uh, being part of that, which is another big achievement, I think, um, because this is an IMI project. And third one is, and building on the comment that our engine colleague gave before, is you managed to work, to work together for pharmaceutical companies. So my, my question is, why do you think it works under this format? What can we learn from it? And should this format be adopted for future initiatives that not necessarily are paid by the European Union, but become more natural as a, a way of working together? Well, that's a, a very good question. I think that uh, we are 25 partners, really different partners, as you said, industry, patients, uh, regulators, payers, different countries, different continents, even different continents. So I think that the, the key of the success is the diversity, and all the partners are really open-minded. In some of sub project where I collaborate, I'm afraid of raising my hand and asking a question. I have never been afraid in necessity because we are all different and some around the table are not doctors as well. You know that difference? I mean, some patients sometimes really feel inferior and don't and can't speak to doctors. They're the huge step in some projects. In necessity, around the table, you've got one doctor, we've gone, you've got one economist or statistician, one patient, one regulator or payer, okay? We all have experience, we all, will have, will, we all have something to add, something to bring as an expertise. And nothing, no one considers his expertise more valuable than 
the neighbor's expertise. And to be honest, I really think that public and private partnership is also a key because it, it brings different perspective again from maybe, again, question of point of view. But um, I think it's, again, I think it's a key to, to succeed on a very huge consortium like that. You can create subgroup with different people and every, everyone can bring, um, again, expertise and added value compared to maybe some academic project with only doctors. And I totally understand that if someone is not doctor, we won't speak the same language. We won't easily understand on what it's uh, about. And it will be losing the time and energy for everyone. In that project, I mean, maybe half, half of the people, maybe not, maybe one, one third of people are not doctors. So everyone listen to everyone without this, this um, difficulty of scientific language and so on. So I think that might explain why uh, it is. And many, many of work package leaders are already used to work on a very collaborative way with different stakeholders. So it's kind of fluid. So what I, what I basically hear in your answer is that the academic and the industry partnerships where you're involved in, they're not true partnerships because there is a dominant partner. I think we need to th think about how we can evolve that partnership and make sure that you feel comfortable expressing yourself in front of other people, be it physicians or industry partners. So I would thank you very much for that. Okay, thank you, Coralie. And I'm giving you to present. Oh. So now, please welcome Emily Bone. Is that correct? Yeah. Emily. Emily is um, Patient Engagement Center uh, at Janssen Pharmatical um, Companies of Janssen and Janssen. So please co correct me uh, on your correct title uh, Emily. <laughs> sorry i know it's a very it's a very long title yeah. as well anyway hello everybody and thank you very much for inviting me here today so uh, my disclosure is that um, that this presentation was originally going to be given by my colleague, Marcia Mangalars, who is our patient engagement lead for Sjogren's. Um, but uh, Marcia is not here because she was very lucky to be one of the very few people selected um, for a, a prono, pro bono initiative that uh, my company is helping to sponsor with an NGO in India, um, which is looking at empowering the urban poor in Mumbai. Um, so I'm afraid it means you've got me instead. Um, and though whilst I can't claim to know a huge amount about Sjogren's disease, although I have to say I have actually learned quite a lot in the last couple of hours, um, I do have long experience of patient engagement in the pharma industry. Um, but what I would say, if there is anybody in the audience who would like to know more about the, we, the work we do in this disease area, I have my great colleagues, Wim and Roy, in the audience, who will be happy to talk to you about um, all the work that we're doing here. Okay. Oops. Good. So, in my relatively brief presentation today, I'm going to give you a short introduction to my company, Janssen. Are we good? Right? Um, and just to kind of, I guess, reinforce, not that I need to with this audience, why patient engagement these days is very much a must-do. And if there's time, we'll also go through a case study as well. Okay. So about my company, so this very dapper gentleman in the, you can see on the screen is Dr. Paul Janssen, who gave his name to the company he founded in, in his home country um, of Belgium back in 1953. Now, Dr. Janssen was genuinely 
passionate about the possibility of improving patients' lives through scientific and medical innovation. And this I know to be true, because by sheer coincidence, my uncle Morris, many decades ago, actually worked for Paul Janssen. Um, he was a much, much younger man then. And allegedly, apparently, Dr. Janssen would march through the laboratories and beer, sir, and demand of the scientists, what have we discovered today? Which I think it didn't endear him to his co-workers very much. Um, so fast forward to 1961, and Janssen was acquired by the large global organization of Johnson & Johnson. Um, Today, J&J um, comprises over 46,000 employees. It has significant investments in dozens of R&D centers and manufacturing sites around the world and continues to be focused on improving patients' lives through scientific and medical innovation. I think the other thing I wanted to say about Paul Janssen is he's also accredited with saying there is so much more to be done the patients are waiting. And I think this ethos of the patients are waiting still very much informs the culture in Janssen today. And I think it's particularly pertinent in rare diseases when if you have a rare disease or, or you are somebody um, who is a carer of somebody with a rare disease, you often find yourself waiting waiting for diagnosis, waiting for the right treatment, or indeed sometimes just waiting for a treatment at all. Okay, so at Janssen we like to say we're creating a future where disease is a thing of the past. And you'll be pleased to know I am not going to go through all the different disease areas that Janssen's involved in, but suffice to say that immunology, which includes autoantibody disease and rheumatology, of which obviously Sjogren's is a part of, is a major area of focus for the organisation. So <laughs> when I first started working in the pharma industry back in the mid-90s, because yes, I am that old, the concept of patients actively contributing to medical research and strategic decision-making in industry, unfortunately, was pretty alien, if I'm honest. And I think even really the concept of patient engagement didn't really exist because if you wanted to know what patients wanted, you would ask a doctor or better still a nurse. Now, I know, which is shocking when you come to think about it, but fast forward to today, and whilst I think there's still plenty of room for involvement, and certainly from what you've heard today, I think it's largely accepted with industry that um, patient engagement in clinical research is no longer a nice do, but a must do. Oopsie. Right, is that? So let's just kind of go back in time, just so we can see how far we've come in the last couple of decades. So I think it won't surprise anybody in this room that prior to the 1990s, um, patients had limited involvement in medicines develop. The what and the how research was conducted was very much governed by healthcare professionals and the research organizations who were funding it. And I think it would be fair to say that whilst industry was always very grateful to patients for participating in their research, they were still very much seen as kind of pa passive participants in studies. In the 1990s, um, uh, with the advent of the internet and the ability of patients to, I guess, find each other and also... Um, find information that historically would have been really difficult to find. I think you start to, you lot see a lot of you in this room remember this, you start to see a shift, a shift from both sides in terms of in the recognition that patients could and should have an active role and a more strategic role to play in medicine's development. 
And so you're kind of starting to see things like um, you know, informed consent um, that patients are required to, 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 to sign before, getting, before entering into um, a, a clinical trial. And then moving on to the 2000s, I think this was a very exciting time for the patient community from, from my perspective in, the, in, the, in, in industry because the more powered patient advocacy groups, I guess, are advocating for patients to have a much louder voice within the healthcare ecosystem in the, in the kind of parts of it that affected them most. So you'll see, you'll see patients... Well, we sort of saw a big rise in the number of patient organisations getting demanding greater access for patients um, in terms of new medicines with the, uh, with the payer authorities. And obviously this case, having more input into, into trial development and trial designs. Um, so moving on to the, the 2020s, so you're starting to see participatory and patient-centred research where, as we've talked today, patients are kind of more equal partners with research organisations, are getting more involved and in contributing at each stage of, of um, the sort of drug development process. And up to today, where, again, you're seeing a lot more, you're seeing more kind of co-creation and collaborative research, the sort of things that we've been discussing already. And I think the other piece that has really made a difference is a massive evolution in technology and digital engagement, which has made it so much easier for patients to contribute to digital, um, to, to, to contribute to sort of clinical trial development. So, um, you know, using things like telemedicine, uh, wearables, apps and the like. Um, good, okay. Um, and I guess we've already talked about this. So it's not just demand coming from patients. I think, you know, there are some very significant stakeholders who are also very keen to see patients being actively involved um, in, uh, in, in um, the, the medicines development process. And I, I'm going to flick over the next two slides because um, Soren very conveniently... Um, covered these already. Oops. So I guess I just wanted to talk a little about, about Janssen's approach to patient engagement. So I think in recent years, we've moved to a model of patient engagement, which means, or we try to make sure, that patient engagement is embedded in, across all the teams and the functions who are responsible for developing and delivering medicines to patients, albeit via doctors. And so essentially, these days, patient engagement is now, or indeed certainly should be, everybody's business. And we now, and we do this by taking a more systematic approach um, of gathering and implementing patient insights um, by start building relationships at the very outset of a piece of research and basically staying with them throughout the whole, each stage of the whole product life cycle. Now, this is easier said than done. That is what we achieve, aim to achieve. But the fact is, companies like Janssen, which are massive are quite often the different departments very siloed. So our global R&D organization sits way over in the US. I have a regional role. I work in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and sometimes joining the dots between the R&D organizations and us working in effectively Europe is, is quite challenging, but it's something that we are really working hard to overcome. Um, and, um, yeah, and so I think accountability is really important, and in terms of measuring the impact of the work that we do with patient organisations. Does it add value to them 
as well as does it bring value into the business? And again, I think this is something that, well, I can only really speak from Janison, but perhaps we didn't really look at in the past, but it's certainly something that we're focusing on now, because certainly for the, for the sort of senior leadership, if you can demonstrate the value to the business, the value to the patients of these collaborations, then you start to see more interest and more investment. And then finally, I think being dynamic is really important and con continuing to sort of challenge ourselves, looking at the pain points and working with, with patient organisations and patient experts to try and, and kind of overcome them. So have we got, hopefully, I have, I have no idea what the time is now. We've got time to talk. Five minutes. Five minutes, right, through um, a case study. So I think this is... Um, this is a, a nice little example, um, not in Sjogren's, um, but it's a, it's a case study which I think just kind of gives an idea of, of how we work together, how challenges are identified and how we deal with them. So this case study is in a very ultra-rare maternal fetal indication, um, and it's an area which is very new to Janssen, um, and, um, and so as such, there is no kind of internal knowledge about the disease and, and the patient community. Um, and I think one of the other slight challenging things is there's also no standard of care. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of groundwork to be, to be done to really sort of get under the skin of the disease, as it were. And so, like most, I guess, companies like mine will do, um, well, this was March, I wasn't involved, obviously, was to set up a global patient council to really, um, to better under, to understand the disease and its impact on patients. So the first priority was to understand the lived experience of mothers with, with this condition. So we asked them about the disease experience, the, disease, the uh, um, their experience on treatment and where the unmet needs in terms of treatment lay. We also needed to understand the emotional, the social and the financial aspects of living with the disease with the aim of providing the Janssen trial teams with better understanding of the impact on the disease and therefore what the most relevant outcomes from treatment should be. Um, the next piece of research um, with the council sought their views on the clinical trial programme with specific input needed around the design and what procedures would be involved and the frequency of these procedures. And out of these discussions, um, the council raised the following concerns. First of all, the need to compare the investigational compound with placebo. And there were some questions around some of the protocol procedures, and there was also concerns around the frequency and the length of the questionnaires that participants would be expected to complete. Now, this is not the first time I've heard complaints around the frequency and length of questionnaires in, in studies like this. Oh, right, sorry, this, this, this slide had bills, which I wasn't expecting. So... Um, now, as you all know, the use of a placebo in a clinical trial is the standard way to assess, to assess the true effectiveness of a new treatment, because obviously this ensures that any effects, any observed effects of the new treatment are not merely down to the placebo effect, which is sensible in theory, but from a patient's perspective, not ideal if you end up in the placebo arm, because let's face it, no one wants to be in the placebo arm. Um, so unfortunately, even though we had originally proposed to have to not have a placebo arm in this trial, um, the, uh, the regulator agencies weren't going to accept this, because clearly without a placebo arm, you've got no proof of the safety and efficacy of the treatment. Um, there was a, a proposed to have um, an option for an external control arm. However, I think that was kind of very complicated um, in terms of kind of sample sizes required. So that wasn't really going to be that wasn't really going to work. So 
Long story short, um, the regulatory agency um, agreed to a reduction in the number of patients required for the placebo arm from a sort of one to a ratio of one to one to a ratio of one to one to two. And also um, standard of care was offered to any people on the um, on the or would be offered to any people on the trial if they request it. And then, um, yeah, um, so I think some of the, some of the is other issues um, were raised, and so some of the pr protocol procedures were made optional as opposed to mandatory, and I think there was a kind of reduction in the number of questions, or the reduced frequency of questionnaires. But I think the point I wanted to make here was had this council not been convened, none of these protocol changes would have happened. And as a result, I mean, we won't know this for sure, but we may have struggled to recruit participants to this trial and or experienced a significant level of dropout of participants during the trial. And as a result, and we've seen this before in the past, in, in other areas, obviously, a trial may have taken a lot longer to recruit and a lot longer to finish, or worse, the data may have been um, inconclusive as a result of the numbers of people dropping out and then potentially the whole thing would have just come to nothing. So I think, you know, it is so, so, so important we have these patients' insights guiding us throughout our medicines um, development processes. And then finally, just to sort of talk about the impact and the lessons learning, learned. So I think to uh, understanding conflicting needs can quite often result in a kind of better middle way through. Two-way communication is key, but I think, you know, in any partnership, two-way commu communication in, um, is key. And I think in ultra-rare conditions like, um, like this one, information on lived experience is really scarce, sort of generally, which is why make making patient engagement even more important. And I think, you know, I think two very important pieces here is also about streamlining the communication from the company to ensure that patients aren't overloaded by multiple requests. And I think this is why it was so important to have this council because basically all the, the research questions from, from the company could be kind of funnel through to these guys rather than what I think had been happening at the beginning, whereas the same patient organisations were receiving multiple requests from different people within the organisation. And again, one of the other things that we um, absolutely insist upon having is a single point of contact for every single patient organization we work with. So again, this kind of filters through any requests or information needed through a single person, again, stopping this kind of bombardment of individuals with lots of requests, or quite often the same requests from different people within our organization. So I think I will leave it there. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Any questions? No. Oh, yes. How do you recruit the patients? How do we recruit patients? Um, that's probably a, a question better aimed at my colleague, Wim. <laughs> so that, I mean, there's multiple strategies towards recruiting patients, and that kind of depends on the indication that you're talking about, the, the rarity of that indication. Sometimes it's very easy, and you just go via physicians, and they have multiple patients for you. In rare disease, you need to be a little bit more creative and find the needle in the haystack. And hence, you need to start working, and that's what we're doing with patients, patient organizations, patient advocacy leads, et cetera. So basically involving everybody who's able to find that needle. I hope that answers the question. If not, uh, we can have a coffee together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, another question there. 
Um, thank you for the very interesting uh, pr uh, presentation. Can you please tell us how you recruit a patient to be involved on the um, and development of the clinical trial? And do you, are you doing it uh, for all kind of medicines? In terms of participants or in yeah, terms on the of... On the development of the clinical trial, not actual... The clinical yeah, yeah, yeah. Trial. So I think, I think the aim is now that we do. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I don't sit in the R&D, the research and development kind of part of the organisation. And my role is ensuring really that actually voices from patients in my region, so Europe, Middle East and Africa, are helping to, in, to sort of shape these trials. Because I think with, with R&D sitting in the US, it's, you, know, you often see a preponderance of US patients being involved. And actually, so, so I guess my role is to make sure that it's a much more diverse patient voice that it's influencing the trials. But I think certainly now, I would say that, and again, it, it's a huge organization. There are a gazillion different trials going on. But I think where we are aiming for, if we are not there already, is to have some element of patient input at the very start, at the very outset of the clinical trial program. Because you, you have mentioned about Middle East, and I am from a country that geographically is is Middle East. Yeah, I yeah. am from Cyprus. Right. And we don't ask, we, we don't have access on clinical trials. And this is a huge problem uh, for our uh, patients with mm. them, uh, especially patients with their r rare diseases. Uh, so you as, I mean, all the industry has to work more in order to be able, uh, right. countries like uh, ours, to have access yeah. on that. Yeah, oh, no, I agree. Yeah. I agree. And I think, you know, we tend to go to the larger, the larger countries because, you know, there we have the relationships. And, you know, I think thinking about my team, they're not actually that many of us. Um, so, again, it goes back to what I have to do in my role as patient engagement excellence lead, long title, um, is to kind of really con con continuing to kind of make very clear the value of patient engagement to the organization because you know i think as i said in my in my presentation you know that we recognize the value of patient engagement when we see it but you know are we doing it are we doing enough to kind of ensure that we are investing in patient engagement you know I would love to say we are, but I, still, you know, I think there is still room for improvement. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we are now closing this first uh, clinical research session. Thanks a lot to our uh, presenter and to our speaker, X, for their excellent presentation. We do have a coffee break, and we meet here at 4 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>